The last thing you want is to go before the hanging judge. <laughs> Excuse me. So the attorney would apply for a change of venue. That's an attempt to get the the uh, the matter moved to a different court in front of a different judge. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hopefully, <clears throat> I don't know what's going on here. That frog is stuck. <laughs> Leap the frog. <laughs> Hopefully, in order to get a better decision, mm. something that, to stand a better chance of winning, mm. amen? Isn't that what it's all about? We're going to win things like that. Amen. Well, the Lord revealed to me that that's <clears throat> exactly what young David did when faced with a giant, mm. an adversary named Goliath. And I'm going to ask you to turn with me today to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I'm going to be reading from the Amplified and I'm going to be skipping around <coughs> between the beginning and the end of the chapter. <clears throat> and in 1 Samuel 17 and 1, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle and were assembled at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah. Verse 2, Saul and the men of Israel were encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. So what do we have here? We have the Philistines, who uh, are representative of evil, mm -hmm. amen, mm -hmm. of carnality. They're representative of the dark side, amen, if you've heard that term, uh, the kingdom of darkness. And on the other side, you have God's people, God's army. You have Saul and the people of Judah, the army of Judah. Well, verse 4 says that a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. <clears throat> Goliath was not an ordinary warrior. Goliath was their champion. Goliath was undefeated in battle. No one was able to stand up against this literal giant of a man. It says the champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. It says almost 10 feet. Can you imagine? Almost 10 feet tall. Boy, the NBA would pay that guy anything. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of mail. Do you know what a coat of mail is? No. It's chains that cover, they're just strands of chains that are all intertwined so that a spear or a javelin or even an arrow can't get through. And uh, it says that in verse 6 that he had bronze shin armor on his legs and a bronze javelin across his shoulders. And the shaft of the spear was like a weaver's beam. It says that even a shield bearer went before him. This guy was decked out for battle. I mean, he was 10 feet tall, ugly as sin, probably scarred up and gnarly looking. I mean... This was their champion. He went from battle, from the time he was a boy, went from battle to battle to battle, never defeated. But can I tell you something? <clears throat> Even though you don't get defeated, doesn't mean you walk away unscathed. Mm -hmm. hmm? well. you, you heard them say, you should see the other guy. <laughs> well, Goliath, it says in verse 8, he stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. He was taunting them. What, do you think there's anybody here in your whole army of Judah that's able to battle me? Verse 9, he says, if he, meaning the person that they would choose to battle him, if he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants. But... If I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. We'll be coming back to that. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words from the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 16. The Philistine came out morning and evening, presenting himself for 40 days. Can you imagine? Verse 21. 
And Israel and the Philistines put the battle in array, army against army. All the men of Israel, when they saw this man, fled from him terrified. Now, you got to realize, these, these Israeli warriors, these, were, these guys were tough as nails. They, all they had to do was see Goliath, and they turned and ran. Verse 26, and David said to the men standing by him, my son mentioned that, or was it last week when you preached, or the week before that, that David was sent by his father to bring his brother's lunch. Mm -hmm. So here he is, you know, delivering food. What do they call that? Grubhub. Grubhub. <laughs> he was the first Grubhub driver. He knew what he was talking about. <laughs> David said to the men standing by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now you got to picture this for a minute. He got fee fi fo fum. <laughs> Ten feet tall, scarred and gnarly, dressed in armor, and then you got a little 12-year-old kid. It said he had a ruddy complexion. He had freckles. He was probably red-haired. I think it said something about it red. There's this little kid with a slingshot saying, Who are you, you big uncircumcised Philistine? Meanwhile, all the warriors were running for the hills. <laughs> I think they used the word meshuggah. <laughs> when David's words were heard, it says in verse 31, they were repeated to Saul. Somebody went to the king, Saul, and said, do you hear what this kid's saying down there? <laughs> so Saul sent for him. And David said to Saul, now this is where it gets interesting. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of this Philistine. Don't you be afraid of that big beast. <laughs> Your servant will go out and yeah. fight with him. Mm. <coughs> Saul said, say what? <laughs> and Saul said to David, you are not able mm -hmm. to go fight against this Philistine. You're, you're only an adolescent. Mm -hmm. And he's been a warrior since from his youth. And David said to Saul, your servant kept his father's sheep. Mm -hmm. David was a shepherd kid. Your servant kept his father's sheep. And when there came a lion or again a bear and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it. Can you imagine this kid? I went out after it and smote it and delivered the lamb out of its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by his beard and I smote it and killed it. There's a TV show on man versus bear. Anybody seen it? It's pretty crazy. This guy raised from cubs, grizzly bears, two of them, a, a male and a female. The male is 1,400 pounds, and he stands, when he stands up, he's seven and a half feet tall. He's smaller than Goliath. <laughs> but you've got to see, this bear is like, He's tan, but nobody's going to beat him. People try to do a tug of war with him. He takes the rope with his claw and goes, Phew, and they go like flying. This is what they're dealing with here. They were dealing with a grizzly. This kid went out after that bear, and he grabbed it by the beard and killed it. He says, your servant meaning himself, killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. Listen, for he has defied the armies of the living God. That's what David was riled about. You're not mocking me, and you're not mocking them. You're mocking the God we represent. Now listen to what David said. This, this, tells the whole story. Verse 37, he says, the Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, 
He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Cool. Church, this is crucial. David acknowledged in those words that it wasn't his strength, it wasn't his power, and it wasn't his might that slew the bear and the lion. It was God. Amen. The Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the bear, he will deliver me. Those are words of faith mm -hmm. accompanied by expectancy. Well, Amen. Why don't we talk about faith and hope? That's right. Faith produced a confident expectation. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Amen. Saul was like, so who should I argue? I should argue with you. Go, we tell him. Go. David was then offered Saul's armor. Saul figured, let me at least give the kid a fighting chance. So Saul put his armor on him. David's like, get this off of me. In verse 39, David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones. This really had everybody scratching their heads. What? What are you doing? He's... Reaching down the river bit, picking out stones. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Putting them in his little bag. Then he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David, the man who bore the shield going before him. I mean, th this guy wasn't threatening enough. He had to have a guy go in front of him just to carry shields. <laughs> when the Philistine looked around and saw David, he scorned and despised him. Listen, for he was but an adolescent. He was a kid with a healthy reddish color and, f and a fair face. <laughs> and the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? Remember the kid had a staff. <laughs> Here this guy is armed, he's got swords, he's got spears, he's got armor, he's got a shield bearer, and this kid comes out with a stick. <laughs> he said, what are you, nuts? <laughs> And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, small g. The Philistine said to David, come to me, and I'll give you a flesh to the birds of the air to the beasts of the field. Now, here's the turning point. I said all of that to get to this. Then said David. Then what? Said David. Said David. Then said David to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you, listen, in the name of the Lord. Amen. The God of the ranks of Israel, whom you've defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I'll smite you and cut off your head, you big ugly beast. He didn't say that. I just threw that in for effect. <laughs> And I'll give the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there's a God in Israel. Amen. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Amen. And he will give you into our hands. Yes. Verse 50, so David prevailed. He prevailed over the Philistine, listen, with a sling and a stone, and struck down the Philistine and slew him. Jesus. Church, the turning point in all this was when David said to Goliath, again, understand, it, everything changed with his words. Mm -hmm, that's right. hmm? When David said to Goliath, I come to you in the name of the Lord. You know what happened at that very moment? He said, I come to you in the authority of God. I come to you in the power of God. I come to you ready to do battle in the realm of the Lord. And at that moment and with those words, David literally affected a change of venue. Amen. 
He just took the battle out of the natural realm where Goliath would have kicked his butt black and blue. And he knew it. He took the battle out of the natural realm and into the supernatural realm. He took it out of the natural realm where Goliath was champion and into the heavenly supernatural realm where Jesus is the champion. Yes. Amen? Hallelujah. I mean, be real. There was no way in the world that in the natural this kid could have taken on that monster. It wouldn't have happened. This little kid with a slingshot would have been overpowered and slapped down like a gnat. The battle had to be taken out of Goliath's domain. Amen? Amen? And into David's. It was time for a change of venue. Amen. The battle would have to be fought in a different arena if evil was to be defeated. Amen. If the plans of the enemy were to be foiled, That's right. it couldn't happen in the natural. Friends, David neutered Goliath. <laughs> he took him into an arena where all his worldly carnal armor was rendered useless and meaningless. It was, it was a joke. David took the battle into a venue, listen, where his victory was assured. His victory was assured. He took the battle into the glory zone. Hallelujah. Huh? He took the battle into the heavenly realm where we are more than conquerors. Yes, that's right. Come on, I know that some of you are going through some stuff. I mean, some battles. Mm -hmm. But don't try to win the battle through carnality, through emotion, through, through your flesh. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Greater is he that's in you yeah. than he that's in the world. Amen? Amen. You're more than a conqueror. Amen. The natural realm where Goliath was champion was simply no place to engage him. You don't want to fight with an enemy on his terms and on his turf. Amen? Amen. The natural is not a place where we should ever try and engage the adversary. Amen. No matter what that adversary is. Yes, David was seeing this, <clears throat> this situation from a spiritual perspective. And that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's all about spiritual warfare, church. Amen. He didn't see it from a worldly carnal perspective. David's words changed the venue. That's what needed to happen. Now watch what happened. This is so cool. <laughs> the battle was taken out of Goliath's earthly, worldly realm. The battle now <clears throat> was in the heavenlies. Amen? Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11 in the New Living Translation. Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly, listen, and he wages a righteous war. <laughs> His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. Yes. The Word of God. John, in chapter 1, tells us Jesus is the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. Mm. Now listen, from his mouth, oh, we're back to the words again. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. Amen. Jesus doesn't have to raise a hand. He doesn't have to use a club. He doesn't have to use an arrow or a javelin. He sends his word to affect his will and his plan and his purpose. And guess what? Your victory is his plan and his purpose. What do you think Goliath thought when the heaven's door opened and there sat Jesus? Warrior king. 
on the back of this white horse with the word, the sword of the spirit in his mouth. Oh, talk about change of venue. On his thigh, verse 16 says, on his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. I can't impress upon you enough to stop fighting the battles in the world's arena on your enemy's terms. Get it out of there. Get the battle out of there. Move it to the heavenly realm and you do it with your words. Have you received something helpful today? <clears throat> now I'm going to show you something very interesting. At least it is to me. A closing revelation. This is one for takeout. This is a takeout revelation. <laughs> How long did this champion of evil, Goliath, a type and shadow huh, of Satan, champion of evil, did he come out taunting and tempting the army of God before David spoke out the change of venue? Do you remember how long it was? 40 days. 40 days. Interesting number. You see, Goliath represented the kingdom of darkness. He represented, he was a type and shadow of Satan himself, the champion of all evil. Then after 40 days, David, who was a type and shadow of Jesus, in fact, the word calls Jesus son of David. David used his words to effect a paradigm shift. What is that? It's a fundamental change in approach. That's how it's defined. Something we have to learn to do. Now consider this. In three of the Gospels, Jesus, son of David, was confronted by Satan. And in Luke 4 and 2, it says, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Jesus was taken. He was tempted. He was taunted by Satan. In this world, understand that. In this world where the Bible tells us Satan is the God, small g, of this world. This is his domain. Just like it was Goliath's domain. It had to be removed from that domain in order for there to be a victory favorable to the children of God. But do you know why all this tempting and taunting took place? Satan tempting and taunting Jesus because he wanted Jesus to serve him. He said, if you'll serve me. And how did Jesus defeat Satan at that time? And he said, and he said, and he said. Do you remember this? Yes, the For the sake of time today, I, I'm not going to go into the Gospels and start reading that. But Jesus spoke the word. That's right. Yes. That's right. And that's what disabled it, sent the devil fleeing. He left him for a season. Yes. He took off, just like the men of Israel fled from Goliath. Because they were trying to fight the battle on Goliath's terms. In Goliath's arena, they were not able. We can't fight Satan on his terms in his arena. You've got a greater power, but it 
It's not from this world. You got to get the battle out of the natural arena, church. Change a venue. Important notice. Change a venue. From his mouth came a sharp sword. Church, the enemy wants us too to serve him. He wants us to serve him, not to serve God. And, and he showed his hand in a statement made by Goliath that made it so plain. When Goliath asked for a man to fight, he said, if he's able to fight with me and kill me, which we know he couldn't do, this was a sure thing. In the natural, Goliath was your winner, right? I mean, that would be like, remember years ago, there was a triple crown winner. I'm not into horses, but uh, what was his name? Anybody here know about horses? Seattle Slough or something? I don't know. Some some famous horse. If you put him in a in a, a race with a three-legged horse with arthritis, who do you think is going to win? Huh? That's like us trying to battle Satan, the king of the prince of darkness. We're not going to do it successfully, not on his terms in his arena. It's not going to happen. Not in his realm. We've got to get it out of there. So he said, if he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail over him, which he knew he would, and kill him, then you'll be our servants and serve us. Church, this is what it's all about. The enemy wants you serving him. He wants to be your God. He wants to appear to you to be more important, more powerful, right. more influential yeah. than the God who created the universe. Jesus. Paul broke it all down for us. In Ephesians 6, verses 12 and 13. We're going to start wrapping it up because I don't know about you, but... <laughs> There's some Chinese food in my hand. They got sushi there. It's like, mm, mm, mm. But you can't eat before 12, so. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 12 and 13. Paul said, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Did you hear that? When somebody or something comes against you, remember, there's a devil behind you. There's a demon that's at work there taunting you, child of God, just like he taunted the men of Israel. Goliath stood there and he tempted and taunted for 40 days. I'm sure it seemed like it would never end. Oh, but it did. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. That's why David didn't want Saul's armor. David already had God's armor on. And, and I got something to tell you about God's armor. It's one size fits all, so you shouldn't worry. Put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. You know how God wants you when the battle's over? Like this. Smug. Successful, victorious, Amen. and standing firm in the name of the Lord. When the enemy comes against you, church, how are you going to respond? Church, you've got to know who you've been made in Christ Jesus. You, you've got to know the power of of your words. Mm -hmm. you, you got to know where you 
your battles must be fought. And you've got to know by whose power those battles shall be won. And when the enemy comes against you, you've got to know how to respond. Amen. We have to learn from David's response to Goliath, the symbol of evil. In verse 45 of the Message Bible, I'm going to share these words with you because I want these to be your words from this day forward. Anytime the enemy comes against you, let these be your words. 1 Samuel 17, 46 in the Message Bible says, This very day. This is so good. Listen to this. This is what you got to tell the devil. Yeah. This is what you got to tell the adversary when he's coming against you. Amen. Take your little finger That's right. and stick it right in the demon's face. This very day, God is handing you over to me. Amen. I'm about to kill you uh -huh. and cut off your head and serve up your body and the bodies of your Philistine buddies to the crows and the coyotes. Those Philistine buddies are the powers, the principalities, the rules of the darkness, and spiritual wickedness. The whole earth will know there's an extraordinary God in Israel. And everyone gathered will learn that God doesn't save by means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to God. Listen. And he's handing you to us on a platter. Amen. Would you all stand with me? Did this word encourage you today? Yes. You know, I know, man, that life, it can be tough sometimes. The enemy can be relentless, and he's absolutely heartless. You can come up, worship team. Well, actually, Rob, you're going to be leaving, right? No, he can come oh, up. Oh, he can go up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> got to take word from my wife. we got to know who the boss is. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I want you to say this with me, church. Say, if God be for me, who could be against me? Say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Say this, say, I am more than a conqueror. And my God always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. Give him a shout. Hallelujah.